welcome to ICO's Residency Information Center. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Heather McLeod. I'm the Director of Residency Programs at ICO. So I'm going to start the meeting by talking a little bit about why to do a residency and how to apply. After that, I'm going to have the residency coordinators tell you about their programs and what makes them unique. And then for the second half, it'll be a Q&A with the current residents. So feel free in that portion to unmute yourselves and ask a question or ask a question in the chat. Okay, so why do a residency? One, you want to increase your clinical experience and confidence. Um, you're getting to see a lot more patients by being independent, but also having that assistance and safety net of really experienced practitioners to help round out your knowledge base. Also, it helps you achieve your advanced clinical competency. So it increases your depth of knowledge in the area that you're choosing to do your residency in. And of course, enhancing your clinical skills. You're also forming relationships within the profession. So other optometrists as well as other healthcare professionals. So the faculty and mentors that you're working with, your co-residents, and depending on the program, students potentially. And you're also meeting with other leaders of the profession, going to professional meetings, interacting with other ODs around the country. And then as well as MDs in terms of co-management of cases or in referral situations. It's also increasing your professional opportunities, so you have better prospects after the meeting. I mean, after your residency. So, if you're interested in academia, the VA, hospitals, um, an MDOB practice, um, if you're interested in staying in industry, or even having CE opportunities, people search out residency trained optometrists. So if you look at the categories of residency, they've kind of reorganized the titles of residency recently. So there's five main categories, and these categories account for 50% of the clinical and the didactic program. So you could be in primary care, pediatric optometry, coordinated contact lens, vision rehabilitation, or ocular disease. So in addition to having a general main type, certain residencies also have areas of emphasis so they can have up to two areas of emphasis that you'll see and it's you can see it's a long list and some of these areas are actually um, the same as the main type so you may have a coordinated contact lens residency but that also has an emphasis in ocular disease meaning that 30 percent of clinical activities and didactic activities relate to ocular disease so how do i find a good program um, one of the main ways is looking at the ASCO residency directory. Um, on this page, you're able to search by the type of program you're interested in. You can search by location. So do I want to be at a school, at a VA, a hospital, a private practice? You can also search by area of the country. If you're determined like this one area, I want to stay in the Midwest. I want to go to the East Coast. Um, you could also look for combined residency and graduate programs or you can pick based on the school that it's affiliated with. This ASCO residency information is what's funneled into OR Match, and OR Match is actually where you're applying for your residency. So you apply by registering at OR Match. There's a flat fee that covers about 10 applications. So if you want to apply to more than 10 um, residencies, then you pay extra fee per extra application. Um, the deadline suggested by OR Match is December 31st to have registered. And all of the application material is due by February 14th. But every individual program can set an earlier application deadline. So make sure that you're checking the individual residency programs that you're interested in to see what their specific deadline is. Um, requirements. I mean, each program sets their own requirements and deadlines. Once you're interested in a residency program, you can add them to your queue of applications. So once you've registered, adding into your 
<laughs> you can start adding programs in your queue. And once you've added a program into your queue, the coordinator will then get an email with your name and email. So they may reach out to you. They may send you further information or nothing may happen. Um, just because you've added them into your queue doesn't mean you'll have to finish your application, but it does let the coordinator know this is a residency you're considering. Your application to be completed on ORM match includes letter of intent, your CV, your transcript, and three letters of recommendation. And again, depending on the school, they may ask for additional information. So check the program's requirements. This is just a list of timelines. So ORM match opened in October. And again, the deadline to just apply to ORM match is December 31st. OR matches deadline is February 14th for completed applications. But again, remember programs can set that deadline earlier. So some of them set it two weeks or even a month earlier. Um, interviews, depending on the program you're interviewing for, it could be as early as late January or even early February. In March, you can start entering rankings. So after you've done your interviews, you can decide which programs you want to rank, the programs that you really see yourself um, being happy doing a residency with. And then on March 29th, the results are released to the match. So that's match day. So just a point about how to be a competitive candidate. Um, if you haven't taken part three, it's good to take it earlier in the year so you can have your scores. Look for people to write you glowing letters, people that really can comment on your clinical abilities and will write you personal letters. Those are the people you really want to get for your letters of recommendation. Prepare for the interview. You can kind of guess what some general interview questions might be. And reach out to the coordinators. And I would do that early. So you don't have to have a completed application. You can just have an interest in a program and you can reach out and ask for more information. Or you can ask for an email of the current residents and ask them questions. But it puts your name in front of those coordinators early and that'll make you stand out because the rush of applications happens um, around December, early January, and you can just get lost in the mix. So if you reach out early, that can make you stand out. All right, so tonight we'll go through all the ICO affiliated programs and the coordinators are going to tell us about it. We're going to start with the on campus programs and then we'll move into um, our private practice programs a hospital-based program, and our VA and federal health centers. Okay, so before we get started on all the ICO um, affiliated programs, Dr. Wynn, if you want to play the video, and I'm going to stop presenting. Welcome to the Illinois College of Optometry, located in the beautiful city of Chicago. The residents have so much to offer. In addition to being one of the oldest schools in the nation, Fully equipped clinic provides residents with all the tools they need to precept students, provide direct care to patients, and play a role in instructing clinical skills in student labs. Residents have the privilege of attending weekly conferences, journal clubs, and presenting grand round cases. Residents receive their own office alongside their program coordinators and co-residents, giving a family feel to the program. As you can see, ICO provides a good balance of hard work, 
relaxation, camaraderie, and a place to keep up good health. All in all, the residency at ICO is a slam dunk. Take it away, Dr. Fromstein. All right, let me go ahead and share my slides. All right. Okay, I'd never seen that video before. It was excellent. Thank you, Christina. And uh, we're gonna start off with another one, short and sweet, hopefully if it works. Dr. Frosty, I don't think there's sound. Sorry, say that again. I don't think that we can hear the sound. You can't hear the sound. That's terrible news. Christina, do you have the video? I do and I can share it for you. All right, perfect, thank you. I'm requesting control from you. Oh, I didn't realize I had that power, sorry. Sorry, give me a second. Welcome to the cornea, contact lens, and ocular disease residency. Our resident is trained in fitting a wide variety of patients, from soft to specialty contact lenses. This residency is equipped to focus on diagnosing, treating, and managing complex corneal, anterior segment, and contact lens related conditions. Our resident room has everything you could possibly need. Get in touch with Dr. Frontstein or our resident for more information. Thank well, you so much for that. And oh, I didn't get control. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully it works this time. So now we have to disinfect Dr. Martin's entire room because he touched all the instruments. Um, but that's okay. So we can skip to... By far the most common question I get, um, Christina, you can see everything, right? It's working now? Yes. Okay. Um, which is what does the average week um, for our resident look like? And I think that this is important because the resident at our on-campus con cornea and contact lens residency does so many different things. So Monday, popular day, it's your day off. Um, on Tuesday, you are at a private practice in the suburbs of Chicago, um, Chicago Cornea Consultants. It's an ODMD combined practice. You're seeing your own schedule of patients, which are specialty contact lenses, pre-ops, post-ops. You get to see um, a lot of the medical management of surgical um, patient care. On Wednesday, you are on campus all day long. It is a long day. It is a strong day. A lot of people really enjoy being here from 8 a.m. to almost 8 p.m. Um, you are doing some combination of direct care and precepting. So you start off all direct care, eventually you move to more of a 50-50 direct care and precepting. 
Um, and you also later on in the year start to be in the on-campus lab. So the basic and the specialty contact funds lab. On Thursday, you are doing your advanced care rotations. So you work with the on-campus OMDs and rotate through cornea, retina, and glaucoma. This used to be a, a hospital-based rotation. We moved it on campus because of COVID-related things. So far, it's been really successful and um, might be the permanent state of affairs, depending on what the future looks like. If anyone knows, let me know. On Friday, you are in urgent care. So you run a robust urgent care service. Everything and anything walks through the door. Um, it keeps you on your toes. It keeps your skills fresh. People really love this part of the rotation. And then some of the seminars that were alluded to in the, in the video that Christina made. And then Saturday, you're right back on campus. We like to keep you here a lot because we really do have a huge wide variety of um, patient and patient care. And it really is a robust set of uh, patients to learn on. So we bring you back. It's a nice, easy Saturday. And um, as you can see, Monday through Saturday, no two days look alike. Um, so it keeps the year moving pretty quickly. I think that maybe Dr. Martin would say too quickly. So just really quickly, a few other FAQs that I get asked all the time. So like I said, you start off all direct care to kind of get your feet wet and then move up to a 50-50 split between precepting and direct care. You will have lab responsibilities in the contact lens labs. Um, research and lecturing are certainly encouraged and most residents take advantage of it, but they are not requirements of the program. And last but not least, there is definitely some flexibility in your scheduling to add um, different rotations as interests dictate, um, including an on-campus ocularist who is wild and crazy and fun and very, very talented. So I am Dr. Fromstein. You can reach me here. Our resident is Dr. Martin. You can reach him at that email if you have any further questions. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, next up, Dr. Randall, you want to talk about ocular disease in primary care? Yep, I'm just going to have Christina play the intro video and then I'll get started. Welcome to the Primary Care and Ocular Disease Residency. Let's go exploring. Cirrus OCT. Popcon Triton OCT. Heidelberg Spectralis OCT. Slitland Camera. Claris Fundus Camera. Optos Widefield Fundus Camera. In this multidisciplinary setting, our well-rounded residents manage complex cases alongside students, fellow optometrists, and ophthalmologists in many aspects, including primary care, retina, neuro, glaucoma, and urgent care. Get in touch with Dr. Rondala or one of our residents for more information. Thanks, Christine. I'm just gonna share the PowerPoint here. Just give me a moment. Okay. Oops. One second here. Okay. Sorry that your pictures are Christine in the center. Um, so my name is Dr. Rendawa. I am the coordinator for the Primary Care Ocular Disease Residency Program at ICO. Um, a few things about this program that I think make it exciting and unique, um, you get to see a large volume of patients, diverse patients with complex oculosystemic disease, and you get to strengthen your triaging skills while being on call. So our disease residents do go on call along with our low vision residents about every five to seven weeks. You guys build that schedule yourselves so you don't have to miss any important family events or if there's a certain holiday you want off, we make sure that it's fair and even. Um, and then you also have the ability to tailor your experience. So um, it's not mandatory or required, but if you're somebody who wants more experience in didactic teaching, teaching opportunities in lab, say you want to do a rotation in specialty contact lenses, pediatrics, or low vision rehabilitation, 
you do have the opportunity to do that every quarter here. Um, so I think some of our residents, I know I enjoyed it myself as a former resident, and our current residents are also enjoying that benefit. Um, you get to work alongside highly trained residency faculty and doctors with a variety of expertise and backgrounds. So, um, you know, our ICO students might know we have a lot of OMDs that come on campus. You become confident working in an interdisciplinary setting as well as working alongside and writing letters to doctors um, for your patients. And then we also have a very robust clinical educational conference program for our residents. So every Friday at 8 a.m. we have urgent care conference where our 10 residents meet and discuss their urgent care cases, um, get insight from different faculty and different expertise. And then we have a resident conference every Friday afternoon and topics range from learning how to use some of that advanced diagnostic testing we have, interpreting fluorescein angiographies, sometimes we'll have an oculoplastics lecture. It's very, very varied. Um, and then you also do get to join in on our faculty conferences whenever we have those going on as well. Um, and then for those of you who want to gain more experience in presenting and lecturing, our residents present a grand rounds case to fourth years and faculty uh, fall, winter and spring quarter. So we help you prepare for that and hopefully make you feel more comfortable with public speaking. A sample schedule, it changes every quarter, so it's a little bit different. Um, our residents have about eight sessions. They're split kind of evenly between primary care and the advanced care sessions. Um, in green, you can have your primary care sessions and then your advanced care sessions rotate between neuro, retina, glaucoma, comprehensive ophthalmology, and of course you can also fill one of those slots with an elective that you're choosing. And then from July to November, it's primarily direct care for the residents. You're working underneath another attending doctor. And then November, you're released and you're signing charts on your own um, to the end of the year. And you get about one and a half to two and a half days of precepting students there. So again, if teaching precepting is something you want to try out, this is a good experience for that. Now, even though you're released, your attendings are going to be available for consultation throughout the entire year. So you're never going to be completely let go, especially with those complex cases where you might want a second eye on or a second opinion. And then our urgent care, um, like Dr. Fromstein mentioned, that is going to be your one session that remains the same every quarter. Um, so again, a very robust clinic. It's exciting. It's fast paced. It really gets you comfortable with triaging and treating the unknown and how to handle that. Um, and residents really enjoy that experience. Um, and then on Friday, your conferences, that is something that remains the same throughout your schedule as well. Saturday is always your day off unless you're on call, you pick up an extra shift on Saturday morning. Um, some other kind of perks that we do have, you get your own office as a resident here at ICO. Um, you have access to ICO's library resources and the career development and financial aid offices. So I know I really appreciated that as a new grad, figuring out kind of my loan payments and things. So that's just an extra perk. You have medical and dental insurance, um, covered travel expenses to present at national meetings, such as um, academy and optometries meeting, and then of course the camaraderie and collaboration. Uh, so not only do you have the support system of your five co-residents in the disease program, but you also get to um, kind of run cases by and chat with your five specialty residents in pediatrics, cornea, and low vision. So while the primary care inocular disease residency program at ICO really well prepares you for a career in academia, it's not just for those that are interested in academics. So our graduates go on to work in all aspects of optometry, uh, whether that's private practice, uh, VA staff, OD, MD practices, hospital settings, and commercial practice. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Rendawa. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, and you can certainly reach out to our five residents, Dr. Megan Beyer, Dr. Nora Kubi, Dr. Pedro Porzeni, Dr. Alessandro Roya, and Dr. Nogar Sobati. Thank you, Dr. Randall. Dr. Allison, are you ready to talk about? Um, yeah, uh, uh, Christina, can you send us, uh, put on our video first? Okay.
Welcome to the Pediatric and Binocular Vision Residency. Our residents are trained to be well-rounded in all aspects of pediatrics. Newly renovated, our clinic has state-of-the-art equipment, enough room to social distance, and great diagnostic machines in order to keep our exams efficient. Join us by reaching out to Dr. Allison or one of our residents. Thanks, Christina. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, hopefully you can hear me and you can see the screen here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the PEDS program at ICO. Uh, we're binocular vision and pediatric optometry. So we do both um, pediatric optometry as well as vision therapy in our program. Um, I'm Dr. Allison and my email is here if you need to get in touch with me. I'm not able to see your screen. Oh. Hmm. Okay, let me try it again. Hold on. Let me... How about now? Yes. Okay, I'll go back one slide here for a second. So again, my name is Dr. Allison and the information <coughs> for uh, the PETS program. Um, if you have any questions, here's my email. Our current residents um, are Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Cohen. Um, one's from ICO, the other is from Salus. So if you have questions specific to whether you're coming back um, to, from ICO to the program um, or coming from a different school to ICO, you can kind of gear your questions towards which of those might be best for you. And we always have two positions available in our program. Basically, a, a question I get a lot is, you know, how is it divided? It, it ends up being about 60% pediatric optometry and about 40% vision therapy. Um, throughout the whole program, you'll be doing both of those things. Now, we do have flexibility in that. So if some of the uh, residents decide after half of the year they want to do more VT and less direct peds or vice versa, we certainly can do that. But throughout the entire program, you do at least have one session in each of those areas as you go on. Um, Unlike other schools, the PEDS clinic and the vision therapy clinic are in the same place. So it actually is very nice because you actually might be able to see some direct care patients. For instance, right now, Christina on Wednesday night, she sees direct care PEDS patients, but her last patient of that session is a vision therapy patient that she wants to see. So you can kind of schedule your patients um, easily based on wh where you are at the time and what they need because everything is in the same place. We do have a very complex patient um, population overall, uh, particularly our pediatric patients, you're gonna see a ton of strabismus, um, amblyopia, uh, intermittent exotropia, constant exotropia, esotropia. Uh, we have patients who come in with um, head trauma as well. So a whole variety of patients in that same clinic. Our residents average about a thousand patient encounters um, throughout every residency year. Last year, even with COVID, our residents both hit more than 1,000 patients. We do have um, a session on Tuesday afternoons where we actually have a PEDS low vision clinic session. Um, it's just starting out, but it gives the residents an opportunity to, to dabble in that. As well as every other Tuesday, we have a ophthalmologist, um, a pediatric ophthalmologist come and work with the residents. Um, and the residents help them work out patients that they may be doing surgery on or other uh, preferred patients. We also have a development disability clinic, a separate session there. Now throughout the time in pediatrics, um, we do see lots of patients with disabilities, with children with autism, um, other conditions, but we also have an assigned development to dis developmental disability session. So if you have a real strong interest in that, we can get you in that session um, as often as you need to be. So, you know, some of the other questions we kind of get is, you know, do we do direct care or we do pre a lot of precepting? You will do direct care all four quarters, all throughout the program. 
Um, you start precepting around the winter quarter, so that's usually in November, in pediatrics and in urgent care as well. At that point, you'll be off of probation and be able to precept. You start out with just one session of precepting in peds and one session um, in urgent care. And again, depending on if you'd like that or not, we can do more or less as the program progresses. The residents also precept in three of the four quarters. They precept in our vision therapy lab, our strabismus lab, and also the visual perceptual, <coughs> excuse me, lab. Again, we also do the three grand rounds presentations. And at the end of the program, you have to do one paper of publishable quality. Um, we also do encourage the residents and work with them to submit posters um, in the academy, for COVD, uh, for AOA, even things like Heart of America. Uh, we do have a lot of flexibility in your program, and that's one of the kind of shining beacons of our program. <laughs> throughout the session, throughout the entire year, you're still um, participating in urgent care sessions. So you will be able to keep all of your skills as far as prescribing um, medications, seeing uveitis patients, retinal detachments. Our residents have seen a lot of great things already in urgent care, even though they're PEDS residents but they don't do the overnight call that the primary care residents do. You do have opportunities to be part of other clinics as well. So for instance, right now, one of the residents is in um, cornea contact lens because she wanted to be. Another one was, is in primary care right now because she wanted to be as well. Um, so we try to make it flexible. So if you want to keep all of your time in pediatrics, you can do that. If you decide that you want to take a session here or there in other uh, clinics in our school, you can do that as well. Now this year, things are a little bit different with COVID, but traditionally twice a year, the residents get to go to the Illinois School for the Visually Impaired, where they get to provide services um, for two and a half days to um, children with visual impairments that live at the school and also ones that are brought in from other programs. We also have twice a year them participate in the Special Olympics Lions Club International Opening Eyes Program, where they get to work with, again, patients who have um, dis developmental disabilities. We are also a PEDIG research site, so if you're interested in research, residents can be involved in that. Um, and we also schedule the residents to, to go out um, to see other people's practices um, who are doing pediatrics in their practice, whether it be a vision therapy only practice or a practice that combines primary care with pediatrics and vision therapy. Um, so we do that you know, at least once a quarter. We also have a very large, you know, the highlights of the program essentially are that we have a really large volume of complex patients. We have that flexibility to work in other clinics. Um, you have an opportunity to work with really experienced faculty who see these kind of patients every day, all day, um, and can really give you a good feel for how they manage the patients. And also our faculty have different viewpoints on management. So that's really a bonus to our program. You are encouraged to attend both the COVD meeting and academy meeting, and also many residents have chosen to do things at AOA um, and other local meetings as well. And then the benefit also is that Chicago is a great city with a lot of things to do, great restaurants, music, events, um, and certainly a, a nice place to live, at least for one year. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or any other residents. Thank you. Switching gears, we're going to move on to our private practices. Um, let's start with Dr. Lang at Associated Eye Care. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. McLeod, and thank you to ICO for this opportunity, and thank you for your continued uh, help with our program. I'm going to try and pull up my slides here. Okay, I have to allow you to share it, it looks like. Hang on a second. Um, so we have a 54-week program, um, specifically uh, focusing on ocular disease. So this ocular disease residency, uh, you will be seeing ocular disease patients. It's almost entirely um, triage and um, urgent emergent cases. Um, let's see if I can get this rolling now. Let me see if it'll share. All right, let's see. Can you guys see my screen now? Guessing that's a no. 
Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, okay. we can see. Do you see my presentation now? But not of your presentation. OK, now we can. All right, I'm going to just assume you can. Um, so 54 week program. Um, again, a lot of triage, emergent, urgent, and also um, continued care. So if any one of us sees an ulcer um, and that needs a, a follow up the next day, most of the time we're going to be sending that to the residence clinic because they have the most availability and, and that's what their uh, clinic is really built for. We are an integrated care facility, so MD, OD practice. Um, I'll go through the uh, staff, but I think it's about 10 MDs to six ODs right now. Um, and uh, as you can see by our logo, our motto is vision for a lifetime. Um, by that, we mean we are seeing pediatrics to geriatrics. So we have pediatric specialists, retina specialists, glaucoma specialists, and everything in between. So the strength of our residency really is the diversity of ocular disease you're gonna see. Um, you're gonna get a little taste of everything. Um, no holds barred, here we go. So. There are after hours and call um, uh, clinics um, and duties. Um, call runs Friday to Friday and would be every third week. Um, we encourage you to present at our local meetings, national meetings, um, as well as grand rounds at Associated Eye Care, Minnesota Optometric Association. We, um, do get you included in the other residents in Minnesota. Um, so again, we're located on the eastern side of the Twin Cities um, and actually technically western Wisconsin, but usually the resident doesn't go into Wisconsin. Um, so we get together quarterly with the other residents, optometric residents in Minnesota, Twin Cities area. Um, so we kind of have pizza and beer and talk about journals quarterly. So you're not all by yourself. Um, there's our salary and benefits, so pretty typical stuff here, benefits, but we also have a stipend to, for travel um, and cover uh, all uh, license related um, expenses. So uh, this is our staff. Uh, Dr. Goddard is one of our DOs, not OD, but DO. Uh, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Park are comprehensive. Uh, they both do LASIK as well, these two. Um, so we have a little bit of everything, like I said, LASIK, retina, glaucoma, uh, la uh, femcosecond cataract surgery. This is our pediatric team, Dr. Lynch, Dr. Schloff, and Dr. Hickson, our pediatric optometrist, which you would spend time with every provider. Um, from time to time, we rotate you through. You'll get to know everyone at Associated Eye Care, including Dr. Downey, our retina specialist. And our glaucoma team, we actually have a team for glaucoma now, which consists of Dr. Brian Tiener and Dr. Laura Capel, our op, uh, optometric glaucoma specialist. Um, and cornea, uh, Dr. Jesse Vishlachelle from Iowa is a cornea guy, so he does all our transplants, uh, DSAC, DMAX, um, and all that fun stuff, all the fun ulcers, fungal and otherwise. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, our current resident, is on here tonight, and he'll be willing to answer any questions you have. I think he's probably the best resource about what your week looks like, but it's usually four and a half days a week of clinic. Um, and uh, that other half day is uh, academic time. We use that term loosely, but it's academic time. Dr. Wu, one of our comprehensive ophthalmologists, but also does a fair amount of our plastics work. And then our optometrists with everyone, um, but you'll have a lot of independent clinics um, where you run your clinic and come get us if you need us. Dr. Feeder, myself, um, I do a lot of cornea as well and uh, specialty contact lenses. Dr. Lavalley and Dr. Nicole Harris, maybe some of you ICO people recognize her face. And of course, Dr. Schmidt might be uh, someone you recognize as well. His email is up here. Um, again, he's on tonight if you have more questions about associated eye care. Um, our locations, so Stillwater's uh, about uh, 15 minutes from St. Paul. Um, it has an ASC and a LASIK suite. Um, pretty nice new clinic, about 10 years old. And our uh, Woodbury, which is again about 10 minutes from St. Paul um, clinic, new clinic for uh, two years ago. Um, most of our pediatrics goes through there. And then there's some satellite clinics. The resident really only goes to Woodbury and Stillwater, but 
to have you work with some of the other providers, especially early on as you're getting credentialed. We sh uh, ship you around to work with work with everyone and, and see what else is going on. So we have towns some of you probably never heard of, but um, are affiliated with some hospitals uh, in Western Wisconsin as well. And then we have an administrative building that you would be at when you're getting credentialed and orientated and centers all of our call stuff. So we have a pretty fun culture. The ODs and MDs work together hand in hand. Most of the time, uh, patients don't know if they're seeing an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, and that's the way we like it. Um, but the culture is pretty fun. We try and engage all the staff um, with different things. Uh, COVID's made this a little bit more difficult, as everyone can claim to you. But um, you can see some of our MDs and uh, people working working hard and, and uh, playing hard as well. Um, so all staff meetings and also um, some outreach things. Operation site through uh, uh, the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery um, is charitable surgery that we try and provide uh, once or twice a year as well. Um, so we try and work hard and play hard. And any questions for me, we can answer later. But I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let you guys move on. Thank you, Dr. Lang. We're actually going to go back to our last on-campus program. Dr. Crumbless, can you tell us about vision rehabilitation, geriatrics, and ocular disease? Absolutely. Um, Christina, can you go ahead and show the video for me? Welcome to the Vision Rehabilitation, Geriatric and Ocular Disease Residency. Our newly renovated clinic has a variety of diagnostic machines available to fully care for our patients. Our OT clinic even comes with a small kitchen to help train patients with their devices. Our residents have everything they need to see our disease-heavy patient population. Reach out to Dr. Crumbliss or our residents to learn more. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Right. So um, similar to all of the on-campus programs, um, I think just to speed things up, most people we've discussed kind of the benefits into including uh, travel stipend, um, medical and dental. Um, it, this residency has an emphasis on low vision. Um, it's four sessions a week uh, throughout the year, and that's mostly direct care, though uh, starting in as early as winter quarter, um, the residents can request to do um, precepting. Uh, you will also instruct lab. And one of the advantages of this program is the diversity of the, of the diseases that you'll see and the varied population that you're serving in vision rehabilitation, both from pediatric to adult. Um, ocular disease comprises three sessions a week, and that's in geriatrics and specialty clinics in advanced care, including glaucoma, retina, and neuro. Um, each resident also has once a week an urgent care service and uh, about four weeks on call throughout the year. Um, you also get one development session each week and then uh, the conference, which is all of the residents. Uh, there's an urgent care conference in the morning and in the afternoon there's varied topics and conferences in which the residents also assist with presenting to each other. Um, you can request electives which was one of the advantages of doing an on-campus residency is that you can at request to do electives in all of the surgery all of the services whether that's primary care, cornea, pediatrics or developmental disabilities. So if you have another area of interest or just an area of clinical skills that you don't want to um, that you want to continue to develop after graduation, we can certainly work to try and build that into the schedule. 
Each resident presents three grand rounds presentations throughout the year, as well as um, to complete the program, you're required to produce a paper of publishable quality. Uh, we do strongly encourage research. The current residents were awarded a research grant from the Illinois Society for Prevention of Blindness. So that's something we offer mentoring with and the hopes that you'll present at meetings um, as well as present that research. Highlights of the residency, as I mentioned, there's a diversity of cases, both in ocular disease and in vision rehabilitation. Your week is varied as far as your locations. Each resident spends one day a week at the Chicago Lighthouse, and that comprises two sessions of your direct care low vision, as well as you may rotate, depending on pre-COVID times, to the Illinois School for the Visually Impaired alongside the two pediatric residents at the college. And then you spend your other time at the Illinois College of Optometry. It's very interprofessional. The Chicago Lighthouse employs occupational therapists, psychologists, researchers, and orientation mobility instructors. So you'll get to work with all of those individuals and learn their expertise and when it's appropriate to refer patients and help to co-manage those patients and oversee their vision rehabilitation plans of care. Um, there is, as you saw in the video, a plethora of equipment, both at um, in diagnostic testing as well as in assistive technology. And we've just pictured some of the equipment that you may see at the lighthouse um, here. A plethora of CCTVs as well as getting experience with some advanced devices, assistive technology, including OrCam, as well as BrainPort and iris vision are three kind of newer devices on the market that you'll gain familiarity with if you're not familiar with them already as far as where our residents end up that's a common question and our residents are very have been very successful in their post residency endeavors um, we have two on faculty at the illinois college of optometry um, we have individuals on faculty at Vanderbilt, Mass Eye Ear, Wilmer Eye Institute, Mayo Clinic, um, just to name a few. The majority of our residents do continue to practice vision rehabilitation, at least part time. Um, at what, and many are also in ODMD practices offering vision rehabilitation, as well as using their ocular disease skills that they build up built up through the years. So um, your residency certainly can be put to good use. Um, at the completion of the program. Um, if you have any questions, certainly feel free to reach out to me. My email's here, as well as, uh, as the best, I think the best people to talk to are the current residents, Dr. Arno Arnaldo Trevino and Dr. Katie Walker, and their emails are here, and they'll be online um, later on for questions about the residency. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Krumbus. Getting back to our private practice, um, Dr. Cornish, can you tell us about Davis Stewart Dean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. My request control button is disabled by the sharer company's administrator. <clears throat> let's see if there's other ways that I can share my screen. There. Are you able to see my screen all right? Yes. Oh, perfect. And yeah, it's working positive. It's great. Um, so I run the uh, or coordinate the residency in anterior segment disease in medical contact lenses at Davis Stewart Dean. Um, we're based in Madison, Wisconsin. Where we're here. So Historically, our, our group was founded by two ophthalmologists a long time ago in, in Madison, um, which had kind of blossomed into a multi subspecialty ophthalmology practice, uh, which eventually was acquired by a large medical group in southern Wisconsin and later on acquired by a bigger hospital system based out of St. Louis. So now it has a very long name, SSM Davis Duradine. I care, but it's, we can call it Dean for short or Davis Stewart Dean still. The residency program itself began in 1999. It was originally started actually by one of the refractive specialists who had been with the group for a very long time, John Bukic. And um, the original goals were looking at pre and post operative optometric care of cataract and refractive surgery patients. 
but really it has involved or evolved over the years to incorporate a lot more anterior segment disease, medical contact lenses, and any other ophthalmic subspecialty. Of course, we're affiliated with ICO. One of the main highlights of, of our residency a lot of time is spent in the clinic seeing patients um, with our cornea subspecialist, Dr. Christopher Crowsdale. In his clinic, he's basically the surgeon precepting you and, and you're seeing his patients in his clinic, but you're seeing them first and being able to work one-on-one -on -one with the patients and come up with your own kind of assessment of what's going on with them. Um, and then go over that with Dr. Crowsdale afterwards to kind of get a first-hand look at things and then kind of learn more about what's going on, what next steps need to be taken, et cetera. Um, and then much of the rest of the time, you have your own clinic time. And in your own clinic, you are seeing mainly primary eye care, um, urgent visits, or medical contact lenses. And you can kind of mix and shuffle how much percentage of each we do. Um, although most people looking at this residency have some interest in medical contact lenses. And one of the unique things in the way we have it set up is that you can be seeing patients in Dr. Crowsdale's clinic who are in for consults for keratoconus, Fuchs dystrophy, have corneal scars or history of corneal transplants and they are needing to see clearer and then they end up in your chair the next week or the same week for a, a medical contact, which is pretty fantastic. Um, the other subspecialties in our building are retina, glaucoma, pediatrics, oculoplastics, and general ophthalmology. So there's actually quite a range of things you can see and year after year, um, people have really wanted to get some time with our glaucoma specialists and retina specialists. So we set aside some time to do that as well. As far as some of the things that you would be doing over the course of the residency, there are a few lectures that we would have you prepare and present, mainly two grand rounds cases. One is done with ICO in the fall. And then the other one in the spring can be done either with ICO or with um, a presentation that we do in, in Madison um, called Clinical Challenges that the group kind of has to present to optometrists in Southern Wisconsin. And then there's also an in-service lecture. This is one of our past residents, Dr. Hacker, giving a lecture to the technician staff here at, at the clinic. For research, we do require one publishable quality work, um, preferably in original research, which is usually understandably tough to fit in with a year, but if we can, that's fantastic. Otherwise, case series or reports are always good to look into because undoubtedly there will be a string of very interesting things coming in. Um, and then Weekly Grand Rounds is actually administered by the University of Wisconsin's um, School of Medicine from their ophthalmology residency program. They can just log in virtually and be able to see interesting cases they see over there. And then we kind of go over that or talk about that afterwards at our own clinic. We do have you go to some specific conferences. Um, attending the Gas Permeable Lens Institute uh, conference, in, usually in August, to kind of get the crash course on specialty lenses is one of the requirements. Um, and then we have you go to American Academy of Optometry's meeting and the Global Specialty Lens Symposium. And you can go to more meetings than this. Sometimes people like to do um, optometry's meeting and, and other uh, ones like that. but. Uh, those are the ones that would be ones you make sure you get to. There are opportunities to shadow on site because the, the way the main clinic where you spend all your time is set up is it's actually, it has an outpatient surgery center right in the building. 
So then when there's times when you might not have patients scheduled or one of the surgeons you might be working with might have a day off, you can scrub up and, and shadow other surgeries going on upstairs. This is just an outside view of our clinic from the main parking lot. Outside view of one of the exam rooms with a lot of contacts. And another street view of our, our clinic. Up here, I just have my contact information. I'm Andrew Kornaus. Um, there's my email there if you have any questions or anything else that comes up at all. And then our current resident who you'll be able to touch base with um, in a little bit here is Dr. Bach, and that's her email there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next, Dr. Cruz, can you tell us about Insight Vision Group, one of our newest residency programs? Yeah, let's see. I request control. Can everybody see my screen? Possibly. Not yet. Oh, now. Yes. All righty. So thank you all for uh, having me. Um, we are the newest kids on the block. Um, my name is Tom Cruz. Uh, I'm an ICO grad of 11, did a residency out in Denver at a different clinic. And um, I'm not new to residency, running a residency, because uh, I had we had one at a previous clinic I was at for about eight years. But I finally got my way and went to Insight a couple of years ago and finally got on with ICO. So, um, we're just like a lot of other private um, ODMD practices, moderate to large group. Um, right now, we do have uh, a medical side and a primary care side. As of two weeks, we will not have a primary care side whatsoever. Um, so if you're looking to do any contact lenses or anything like that, your only thing you'll be uh, seen in clinic is a bandaged contact lens. So. Um, on our medical side, we have four optometrists that do all pre and post op, pre and post op care, um, anterior sag, anything from a massive central ulcer to, you know, uveitis, iritis. We comes in the door. We're a large tertiary uh, referral clinic. Three MDs. Um, we have corneal uh, and glaucoma. Um, but you will also be going through a, uh, a very large retinal clinic, um, Colorado Retina Associates likely, um, that I know some of those docs personally, and then oculoplastics, um, also that we work very, very closely with. Um, we have two clinics, one LASIK center, one surgical center, that is ours. Um, so you will have whatever uh, ability to go through those clinics you want to be. Um, our goal is to day one, you're going to, you're going to be in the trenches. So, um, we're, uh, you, you got to see a lot of patients to learn a lot. Um, so that's our, our main focus. Um, you're always going to have a safety net. Uh, you are supposed to fail in, um, in residency, which even in medical residencies, they fail, but they have a safety net. Um, so you're going to be seeing the, baddest corneal ulcers and pathology that you want to see. So this is our uh, Denver clinic. Um, we have the whole building. Uh, we're going to be on the top floor um, with uh, Insight. And then on the third floor, there'll be uh, a retinal clinic and oculoplastics. We'll also have, um, at some point in two years, I believe we'll have our LASIK center up there um, with all the all the toys you want. Um, this is our Parker Clinic, which is about 15 minutes south of Denver. Um, we're currently in a very large uh, medical building with retina um, just on the top of us, but we will be building breaking ground early next year to join right next to our LASIK building. So um, we'll again have medical on one side, LASIK on the other. but. Again, we have all the toys uh, you want, um, OCTs, Pentacams. Um, we have a YAG in office in, in case somebody doesn't want to go to the surgery center. 
um, to have their YAGs done or SLTs done. Um, you got basically whatever you want. Um, our LASIK center has um, cross-linking that actually one of our optometrists does. Um, and we have uh, IPL, Lipaflow, um, again, basically whatever you want to treat a patient um, at an ODMD practice, uh, you'll have it at your disposal. Um, let's see. We have our own surgery center. So again, um, you'll be rotating through the different subspecialties. Again, also having your own uh, clinic that you're on your own. Um, but anything you want to see, um, you're more than welcome to DSEX, PKs, any corneals, uh, any cataract surgery you want to. We have the lens X, the aura. Um, we're just starting to put the Vividi uh, Alcon new lens in. So we'll see how that goes. But um, pretty much uh, anything you want to see. And this is my contact information. Um, if you ever have any questions, it'll also be on the forms match. Also, my cell phone. Um, I'm willing to talk to anybody that that uh, has any questions. Um, I also do know all the other residency directors in in the Denver metro area. So getting the re all the other residents together is good. Um, I'm current Colorado Opt Optometric Association president. So if you want to get involved in that too, you're more than more than happy to welcome, and and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So um, and we have everything that Denver has to offer: skiing, hiking. Um, It'll be 70 degrees here next week, so that's kind of fun, too. So thanks for having me, and I uh, hope to hear from some of you guys and uh, kick off this residency. Thank you. Dr. Bubolt, do you want to tell us about Minnesota Eye Consultants next? Uh, yes, I would love to. Hopefully I can. Share. Okay, is it up? No. Okay. Let's try. Okay, is it up there yet or? I still see Dr. Cruz's slides. I wonder if he has to stop sharing first. How about that? Here. Um, okay, is it up there yet? No. Um, let me see if I can pull it up too. So I'm sharing my entire screen. Um, uh, Dr. McLeod, could you, are you, I sent you an email of some slides. Yeah, I'm trying to back up, but pull it up now. for some reason. Oh, so it says um, it says that it needs permission. We need permission to share to go to oh. Okay. Here we go.
Okay. Did it go now? No. 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 <laughs> I'm having trouble. So it says it's sharing my screen. Oh, we is see it? It now. We okay. See it now. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Dr. Lang from Associated tried to warn me that, uh, um, give me a heads up, and apparently I still failed. <laughs> um, so, uh, as Dr. McLeod referenced, I'm Mark Bubolt. I'm the coordinator at Minnesota Eye Consultants. Uh, so, pictured on the left there is uh, myself and our current resident, Dr. Julia Osowski. Uh, so, we're up in the, the great white north, and it truly is white already. We got we got some snow this week, uh, but uh, we have a ocular disease residency up here um, with an emphasis in cornea and anterior segment, uh, glaucoma, and perioperative care. Uh, so just a quick background on Minnesota Eye Consultants. Uh, so we're founded by Dr. Richard Lindstrom. He's a, a fellowship trained corneal specialist, corneal spe specialist um, started the practice in 1993. Uh, had a vision to to really start collaborative care between ophthalmology and optometry, where at the time it was not um, not the most popular thing to do, uh, but really has taken that vision and turned into a, a fairly large practice. Uh, so we have uh, 13 ophthalmologists in our group, um, and these ophthalmologists are fellowship trained, five in glaucoma, five in cornea, and three in oculoplastics. Uh, we have 10 optometrists um, on our team, um, eight of which are residency trained. Um, and basically our role in optometry is, is uh, to kind of do a little bit of everything in the practice uh, to help to, um, uh, to help to uh, help out our ophthalmologists basically with, with all with post-operative care um, in between follow-up visits, uh, urgent care, um, and then we also uh, fit a lot of specialty contact lenses as a cornea practice. We see a lot of warped corneas come through. So uh, lots of keratoconus and other uh, corneal disease. Uh, we have a, a vast dry eye specialized uh, clinic in our, in our practice where a lot of our optometrists will treat dry eye disease um, as we reference post-operative care. And we also do some comprehensive care. Um, we also have two ophthalmology fellows in our group. Uh, so one glaucoma fellow and one cornea fellow. And then we have two optometry residents. Um, actually, I should say we have one optometry resident this year, but sorry, next year we have two, which I'm very excited about because I think it's just going to um, expand the educational opportunity in our group. Uh, we have uh, lots of patients to see. Uh, usually our, our optometry resident will have about 3,500 uh, patient encounters each year. Um, so I'm not concerned about the, the second resident watering down the experience, but actually um, increasing it just because it's always nice to have a buddy that's kind of going right alongside you and, and learning from each other. Um, and the ophthalmo ophthalmology and optometry uh, fellows and residents really uh, work closely together and, and tend to develop a really close bond by the end of the year. So we have five locations uh, kind of surrounding the, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So one up in Blaine, uh, one on the west side in Minnetonka, one in Minneapolis, one in Woodbury, and one in Bloomington. Uh, for the most part, uh, the, the optometry resident is, is going to stay down on the, the southern four locations. Uh, don't really go up to Blaine. That's basically Canada. Um, but these, these uh, locations down here, uh, we do expect a little bit of travel between um, each location on, on different days. Uh, really quick uh, uh, rundown on some photos. This is our Minneapolis location. Um, not great pictures, they're all covered up, but uh, some good uh, testing equipment. The one in Bloomington is here. Um, and here's our doctor core area and the testing room. Uh, and then Minnetonka on the west side, uh, this is our second newest facility. All of our locations have a surgery center in them as well, which is convenient for the patient and for the doctors. And this is the doctor's core area in Minnetonka. Um, and then our newest uh, building, which is built two years ago in Woodbury, 
Uh, I don't have any in, inside pictures of it uh, on the slideshow, but uh, it's a beautiful building. So um, surgery on the, the second floor and clinic on the first floor. Uh, so, um, you know, basically we have, as you know, a lot of these other offsite uh, locations kind of alluded to too, but we, we should have, you know, basically everything you need to get as good of experience as you can um, for our type of practice. So again, we're uh, very much um, anterior segment, uh, so cornea, glaucoma, uh, dry eye. Um, and so we're going to have all the necessary equipment for that. So we have tear care and IPL. Lipoflow, Lipoview, uh, Blefx. Um, we have all kinds of scleral fit sets. Um, we also, as a, just a clinic, will will do any up and coming uh, glaucoma procedures. We have a research department that um, helps to to coordinate um, different new and up and coming procedures. Uh, we have a refractive surgery clinic, um, and practice full scope uh, cornea uh, as well. So DSEC, DMAC, PKs, uh, you name it. Um, and again, surgery center at every location. Uh, just a quick example of, of a typical or just kind of a standard week in our clinic. Um, every week is like tends to be a little bit different. We're on a five week rotation. So uh, week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, each of those week is a little bit different. Um, but you'll see kind of each clinic is, or each day is built into kind of half days. And so it kind of keeps you on your toes, keeps you busy. Um, part of the clinic is in where you see initials. These are some of our um, mentors that you're in a clinic working alongside them. And then the like these fellow clinic days are days that um, you are in your own clinic. We call it autonomous clinic, but you're seeing your own patients. Uh, you always have backup in the clinic, but uh, seeing your own patients. Um, so feeding off of that, uh, uh, again, about half of the time you're in your own clinic and that doesn't mean you're on your own, um, but you're seeing your own patients and there's always other uh, providers there in clinic with you for second opinions. Um, but these days you're seeing urgent clinic or urgent exams, um, follow-ups and medical exams, post-op visits, et cetera. Uh, you have a technician that works with you and is able to do the, the pre uh, workup. Uh, and then the other 50% is a mentored clinic. And so that's working alongside um, some of our ophthalmology and optometry mentors, uh, not shadowing them, um, but working with their patients, uh, establishing a treatment and diagnosis and, and going over uh, the different patients with, with the mentor. Um, surgery scheduling, or excuse me, surgery shadowing is basically enough sh um, shadowing for you to see every procedure at least once. We don't want to overwhelm you or have you see a whole bunch of cataract surgeries, but um, see see enough of the surgeries that you're comfortable with, with how they operate. Um, and then there are on-call duties about every third week. Uh, you will be on call for the, the practice. Um, you do have backup call. Our ophthalmology fellows are always on backup for um, second opinions, or of course, if any surgical um, uh, surgery is needed. Um, and then as Dr. Uh, Lang had uh, alluded to, uh, we do have uh, journal clubs. We actually have two at Minnesota Eye. One our clinic puts on where our, um, our ophthalmology partners will host. And then we also have a Twin Cities journal club. And then going back up, uh, skipped a bullet point, we have a research project every year that uh, one of our corneal specialists uh, who is the head of our research department will help to facilitate uh, what research we do. Um, that's just a little bit of a background, uh, but I'd uh, love to answer any questions or uh, field any interest that anyone has about our program. So there's my email, uh, or uh, please feel free to uh, email Dr. Rosalski directly as well for any questions. Thank you. Dr. Wallen, will you be able to talk about Vance Thompson Vision? Yeah, I sure will. Let me share my screen here. Do you have me up there? I 
think I have my, do I have my screen shared there? I think it's starting. Yes, we see it. You see it there? Okay. Well, uh, uh, thanks, Heather, and thanks for uh, for ICO for having us on tonight uh, to talk about our residency. Um, my name is Doug Wallen. I'm um, the residency coordinator at Vance Thompson Vision in uh, Balmy, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, our residency is about four years old. Uh, we're a, a private anterior segment uh, specialty practice. Uh, surgical practice in Sioux Falls. Uh, we have uh, four other locations of Vance Thompson Visions, one in Fargo, North Dakota, one in Bozeman, Montana, uh, one in Omaha, Nebraska, and one in Alexandria, Minnesota. Our resident currently spends 100% uh, of their time in our Sioux Falls location. Uh, we have four ophthalmologists at our Sioux Falls location, Dr. Vance Thompson, uh, Dr. John Birdall, Dr. Daniel Trevine, and our current uh, ophthalmology fellow, Dr. Brian Schaefer. Um, we run three uh, specialty clinic galleys uh, in our office. Uh, each of those galleys uh, will consist of one of our surgeons as well as two of our uh, staff optometrists. Uh, our current optometrists here at our Sioux Falls location are myself, Dr. Keith Rasmussen, Dr. Justin Schweitzer, Dr. Jason Schmidt, Dr. Mitch Eibach, and Dr. Lorey Zimprecht, who actually we just hired. She was our uh, optometric resident last year. So we have four ophthalmologists and six optometrists. Again, we're an anterior segment specialty practice, and uh, we uh, specialize in uh, ocular disease. You see a significant amount of ocular disease in our clinic. We also see a significant amount of refractive surgery care uh, from LASIK to PRK to PTK uh, and uh, phacic IOLs as well. Uh, we're a very large uh, referral base for cataract and advanced uh, refractive cataract uh, surgery. So the resident is seeing direct care uh, with patients in our cataract clinics. Uh, we also have a very large uh, glaucoma surgical practice uh, with advanced glaucoma of, of all the surgical options there. Um, and we also have an oculoplastics and dry eye clinic uh, that is run. Uh, one thing we don't, I don't have listed here is that the resident does do a half day of specialty contact lenses, mainly uh, fitting scleral and specialty contact lenses uh, for uh, irregular corneas and any um, patients that our optometric network may refer in for a specialty uh, contact lens fit. Uh, we're a very high volume practice. Uh, we have uh, the most advanced technology you'll find anywhere on the planet, but devoted uh, solely to anterior segment surgery. Um, one of the unique things about uh, our residency is that our resident gets to spend a large amount of time with our ophthalmology fellow. Um, they run journal clubs together, which are once a quarter. Uh, they do a lot of lecturing and uh, work with our uh, research team. We have anywhere from 12 to 16 um, FDA clinical monitored or investigator initiated trials going on at one time in our Sioux Falls office. So they get very involved in anterior segment research that we do. Um, we have a very unique culture and team. Um, we refer to ourselves as a work family. And so uh, we get very, very uh, close with each other and become uh, very, very good friends over this uh, period of year. And we spend uh, a significant amount of time emphasizing uh, the best uh, patient experience uh, for our patients. And so you see a ton of patients, anywhere between 2,500 to 3,500 patients in that year. You're very busy every day uh, in direct patient care. We don't do any primary care at all. We have about uh, 360 uh, referring uh, optometrists in our network that handle the primary care and we handle the secondary and tertiary care. Um, this is a picture of our current MD fellow, uh, Dr. Brian Schaefer and our OD resident, uh, Dr. Kristen Walton. Uh, Dr. Walton will be on 
uh, after the presentations here to answer questions and is is a great person to go to uh, to get questions answered. Uh, you can also talk to any uh, of the other doctors here at Vance Thompson Vision uh, or uh, give us a call or, or email us uh, anytime uh, if you have questions about our residency. But appreciate having us on tonight uh, to talk a little bit about what we do uh, down here in South Dakota. Hope you have a good night. Thank you. Um, switching gears to our new hospital-based program, Dr. Min, can you talk to us about University of Chicago? Happy to. Hold on here. Uh... Can everyone see those slides? Yes. OK, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to Dr. McLeod for putting this program together. Uh, so really excited to um, you know, talk about this new residency program. Um, just a little background information in terms of uh, the University of Chicago. Uh, we're located in Hyde Park, um, and it's a globally recognized university uh, with over 14,000 students, uh, top programs in med, business, and law school. Uh, and adjacent to the, to the undergrad and grad campus, there is uh, the University of Chicago Medical Center uh, that houses over 600 beds, uh, admits over 30,000 patients a year, uh, opened up a level one trauma center uh, over the last uh, year. And I think uh, a unique portion of the of the patients is that uh, there's a lot of diversity in the, the patients we see, and that leads to a lot of diversity of cases. Um, so we treat a, a gamut of complex op ophthalmic disease. Uh, and I think uh, it's important to recognize the university's uh, mission to really increase access for some of the most underserved areas in Chicago. Part of the medical campus includes the Center for Advanced Medicine. Uh, this houses all of the on-campus outpatient services, including our eye clinic. The eye clinic was recently remodeled uh, and opened about a year, a little bit over a year ago. Uh, it houses uh, 24 exam rooms, six procedure rooms uh, for retina, glaucoma, and uh, some anterior segment surgery. Uh, there's a faculty conference room uh, that also doubles as the resident seminar room. Uh, we also have a pediatric uh, waiting room. Uh, we have the spectrum of diagnostic equipment, um, including uh, integration into forum, which should be coming in the next month or so. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we have two running visual field uh, lanes at any given time. So uh, just a little background. That was just a little background on the uh, the medical center and our space, uh, but really I want to talk more about our mission and really what we want to strive for, which is that, uh, you know, this is a very unique opportunity to train at a top academic center uh, doing a residency in ocular disease. And I think it's a little novel in terms of it's a very um, collaborative environment uh, between optometry and ophthalmology and an academic center. Uh, and we want to promote evidence-based treatment of complex ocular disease, which we certainly see uh, we don't have a shortage of that. Uh, and we want to provide surgical perioperative care, including, you know, um, post-glaucoma uh, surgery uh, uh, care, uh, care, as well as rotations with uh, subspecialists. And I, I, we recognize that our team recognizes that independence is key, and uh, we expect the resident to function more independently uh, throughout the training year. Uh, we really want to foster an environment of support, uh, collaboration, and mentorship uh, between the students, uh, the residents, and the attendings. And I think having the ability for ophthalmology and optometry residents to train together uh, really creates a, a really positive impact for our next generation of doctors. So our program design, uh, you know, about 28 hours, so uh, a majority, about 40 percent of the of uh, residents week will be with adult and pediatric ocular disease with one of our four optometry attendings. Uh, and then there'll be an opportunity to participate 
uh, weekly in, in our urgent and consult service that's staffed concurrently with an ophthalmology resident and our ophthalmologist that oversees the consult service. Uh, there will be opportunities to actually round with the ophthalmology resident and the ophthalmologist uh, during their inpatient rounds. Um, and our urgent care, um, you know, it has basically a wide variety. Anything that you can think of kind of walks into the door of the hospital. Uh, so it's, you know, never a dull moment there. Uh, and then I think uh, another key component is, uh, you know, the University of Chicago has a full complement of ophthalmology subspecialists. And so we want to work with the resident and identify areas that they might be uh, more interested or more inclined and um, customize their, their rotations to uh, kind of accommodate their interests. Uh, and in terms of didactics, we have a weekly ophthalmology grand rounds, which includes uh, speakers from different ophthalmology programs. We had a uh, retina specialist from U Iowa uh, just last week. And then we're going to incorporate an optometry seminar weekly that goes over an attending lecture, uh, grand rounds case, uh, journal club. And uh, we are actually working with ICO in terms of a student, a fourth year student externship in the future. So. Uh, we foresee our optometry resident also having some level of preceptorship responsibilities uh, on the latter stages of their training. Our faculty, um, as I mentioned, we have a, a full complement of uh, ophthalmology subspecialists. Uh, we're getting a uveitis subspecialist starting in January. Uh, many of you probably uh, know Dr. Hari Prasad. Uh, he uh, rounds weekly at ICO. Uh, he recently was uh, named the interim chair and He's really excited and really supportive of the program. Um, and along with myself, we have uh, Dr. Kwan, Dr. Harris, and Dr. Nelson, uh, two of which did, uh, did their graduate training at ICO. And Dr. Nelson uh, completed the op uh, ocular disease residency at ICO in 2019. Um, if you have any more information, if you want any more information, please uh, feel free to email me at the uh, information listed on the slide and then also, check out our Instagram. We just started one, uh, so we're curating some content there. You can find more, uh, find out more about our providers uh, and our clinic space. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna switch gears to our VAs and federal health centers. Dr. Richard, can you tell us about Captain James A. Lovell? Hi, this is uh, Dr. Paulette. Uh, Dr. Richard is here as well. I'm gonna take over the screen if that's okay to see if we can put up some slides. All right, are you able to see my slides here? Not yet. No. Oh, it looks like I'm in the same issue with permission for sharing. Sorry, is there a workaround for that? Did you send me your slide? Maybe I could put them. I'm not sure. I changed the settings so everyone can present. So hopefully that helps. Well, Dr. Richard, if you're on there, I can let you talk while I see if I can work through this.
<clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, but no slides, correct? Correct. Let's see if I can pull them up. OK. All right, well, I'll talk about the program. Basically, it's a primary care ocular disease optometry residency. It's a well-oiled machine at this point. Uh, we are going through our 10-year accreditation. Uh, right now, we have uh, have two residents in the program. We're located in a suburb called North Chicago, which is easily accessible by Metro, uh, Metro Station at Great Lakes. Um, beautiful campus. Uh, in fact, the building that we're in was, was put up uh, in 2010, and it's a $200 and, uh, $50 million uh, building. So our mission is to ready warriors, uh, care for heroes, lead the way for federal health care by providing quality patient-centered experience, ensuring the highest level of operational medical readiness. Uh, we're creating a model for the future of federal interagency health care integration, which makes our, our uh, clinic and our whole uh, system very, very unique because we're a joint uh, Department of Defense, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs uh, joint residency. So again, we have one civilian, one Department of Defense resident, and <clears throat> we have a beautiful campus, maybe 300 acres. Uh, we are named for Captain James A. Lovell of Apollo 8 fame. Uh, who is uh, still with us, and uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago. Uh, the objectives of the residency program is to attend a large optometry conference to have weekly educational uh, series, and we, we're very active in, in our educational program. We, we have carved out Thursday afternoons for uh, education and we bring in uh, besides the faculty lecturing we we bring in uh, industry represent representatives now during this residency uh, residents need to see 1500 patients they also have to do a grand rounds presentation at Illinois College of Optometry there's opportunities for research and papers always uh, we have a uh, a uh, vision function lab, if you will, that's uh, connected to some of the work that I've done over the last few decades. So we have a lot of unique equipment on visual function. Um, we get to your, we get some exposure to low vision in this residency, but primarily it's primary care and ocular disease. So it's a very, very nice mix. We also rotate through other uh, clinics at the hospital, primary care, neurology, um, rheumatology, endocrinology, dermatology. So we can customize the, the program somewhat uh, to accomplish goals. And um, our clinic is, uh, you know, it's a multi-functional uh, clinic. We, we basically have uh, a half dozen optometrists, a half dozen ophthalmologists. We share a central core area of equipment. We also have the latest in and, and greatest equipment. We have a, a staff of at least a dozen uh, technicians between optometry and ophthalmology. And um, seven, exa seven optometry examination rooms and uh, special testing areas, uh, et cetera. So I think that uh, uh, is a little bit of a summary. If Chris was uh, our resident, a couple of years back, if you want to talk a little bit about what your experiences was, we have Dr. Kenny Fritz, our current resident at ICO, and Gabrielle, or Dr. Gabrielle or, uh, Finger. So that would be the best people to talk to as far as learning something uh, about the program itself. Uh, one of the unique things I think about our program is that we are closely aligned with the Ocular Wellness and Nutrition Society. Every year we uh, publish a monograph uh, in with a review of optometry, which is funded by Bausch and Loam. And we have our third uh, monograph uh, coming out by the end of the year in wellness. So we like to um, 
focus on wellness, uh, which is, uh, we, th we think, a very unique aspect of the program. Uh, our ophthalmologists are, are wonderful. We have a corneal specialist, Dr. Guo. We have a neuro-ophthalmologist, Dr. Gilbert. We have our department head in ophthalmology, Dr. Uh, Yulansky, who's a retina specialist, and he also does oncology. And then we have ocular plastics and eyelid surgery being handled by uh, Dr. William uh, Stiles. So we work very closely in improving processes, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to just give you a little introduction. I'm sorry if you can't see my, weren't able to see my slides, but that basically describes our program. Terrific, and I think uh, this is uh, Dr. Paulette again. I think you guys were able to see my slides for a moment. Did they pop up there? Yes. <laughs> Okay, terrific. And I, Paul, I apologize for that. So um, I won't take up any more of your time, but um, I do just kind of want to go through a couple things on here that make this make this rotation here a little unique as far as residency programs go. Um, as Dr. Richard touched on, um, it is primary care and ocular disease, and I think there's a lot of emphasis with this program in the primary care aspect and ocular nutrition. Um, there's a lot of wisdom that Dr. Richard brings with the Ocular Wellness um, Nutrition Society, and it's really neat as a resident to be part of that organization for free for the first year. Um, here's a picture of what the facility looks like and kind of gives you an idea of where it is in northern Chicago. There is a metro station right by it, so if you are living in downtown, um, you know, that is an option too. And um, what's really neat about this facility is, is our mission is readying for warriors or caring for heroes. But if you look down the values, it's a truly integrated facility. So it is Department of Veterans Affairs, but it's also Department of the Navy. And it is truly the only type of its facility um, in the country that's truly a fully integrated facility, which makes it a neat place to work at. Um, this was the original hospital from the 1960s, the Naval Hospital, that was torn down in 2013 when we merged the VA and the Navy together um, to make this facility that you're looking at here. Um, it's a pretty large campus. You can see the, the top is kind of the top or the left is what the front entrance looks like, but there's a lot of other buildings spread out. And um, it's named after Captain James A. Lovell, who is the astronaut from Apollo 13. Uh, it is a neat facility in that sense that he is still a living, um, you know, retired captain. So he is in the area and he does come make appearances. Um, and it's the only federal um, building that's in, been named after someone that's still living. So it's neat. If you come, you might have a chance to get to meet an astronaut. Um, this is what I, Dr. Richard always co already covered. You know, some of the uh, requirements here, which are very similar to other residencies. Um, and these are the rotations that you get to spend with other clinics, other, other facilities here. Uh, that's our actual building with our entrance. Uh, our main uh, check-in area here we share with ophthalmology. Just a couple pictures of our rooms, which are all actually going to be upgraded with new equipment probably in the next year or two. Um, our Optos is an oldie but a beauty. It does great for floor scenes, but that probably will get replaced by the time we get um, our new residence. Um, ultrasounds. This was uh, the clinical performance vision testing room that Dr. Richard was talking about with kind of a lot, lot of unique um, testing equipment that uh, I didn't know about before coming here. Treatment room with ophthalmology, um, some of the YAGs and a three chip camera that they have. Field room, our optical, some of the basic low vision that we have. What is neat about our, our basic uh, low vision services is that we're, you know, we're halfway between um, Heinz and Milwaukee. So we do have good relationships with both those places and um, uh, can expand those services if people are interested. Um, here's more information on Dr. Richer and some of the other optometrists that you'd be working with. These are the publications that Dr. Richer has recently got put out in the review of optometry that dives into more of um, wellness and nutrition. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you do become a, a, res, a, a member of OWNS for the first year while you're doing your residency program. And here's uh, some of the ophthalmologists that we work with right next door. Um, really great information and, and time spent in their clinics. So here's our emails if you do want to uh, reach out to us, have any questions. And uh, like Dr. Richard said, we have Dr. Fritz and uh, Dr. Finger um, that will be by for more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Brown, are you available to talk about Jesse Brown, VA? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Well, I will attempt to share my screen, but I'm uh, I might need your help. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I think this is it here. OK, can everybody see the screen here? Yes. OK, um, so I'm Jennifer Brown. Let me see. I'll turn my camera on here. Uh, I'm Jennifer Brown. I'm the residency coordinator for the Jesse Brown and Edward Hines uh, VA residency in Chicago. Um, so we are based out of two facilities, the Jesse Brown VA and then the Edward Hines Junior VA Blind Rehabilitation Center. So we're both an ocular disease and a low vision rehabilitation program. Uh, and we also give a little experience in medically necessary contact lenses as well. Here. Um, the Jesse Brown Hospital is located in the kind of Illinois Medical District and the Hines is located in Maywood. So our mission is just to really offer extensive clinical experiences in diagnosing and management of patients with ocular disease at a postdoctorate level and provide the residents and optometrists the foundation from which to teach, conduct research or practice in a multidisciplinary setting. Um, we place an emphasis on really trying to understand the basic and medical science foundations. We really try to instill critical and analytical thinking skills in our residents and apply that to clinical practice. Um, we place a big emphasis on understanding systemic conditions and how that can affect the underlying ocular pathophysiology. And we do a lot of interdisciplinary communication and work at a multidisciplinary level. The ocular disease portion of our program is based out of the Jesse Brown VA Hospital. So we are a hospital based program. We have high volume of patients with complex ocular conditions and the residents are responsible for doing the full exam and workup, all the testing needed for physical diagnosis. You do your own lab testing ordering and all your own image studies as well. So you order all your CT scans and angiographies and MRIs and kind of get the reports and review them for all the patients you order them for. We have a very high prevalence of systemic disease and also different and how that plays into ocular disease. Um, we interact with a lot of different medical and surgical subspecialties and we have a close working relationship with some departments of ophthalmology. The eye clinic at Jesse Brown is a shared kind of eye clinic facility. We share all the space and we share all the uh, instruments and uh, facilities with two different departments of ophthalmology, the Northwestern Department of Ophthalmology and the University of Illinois Chicago Department of Ophthalmology. The low vision rehabilitation portion of our program is based out of the Heinz um, Blind Rehabilitation Center. The Blind Rehabilitation Center is a really unique kind of program. It's an inpatient low vision rehabilitation center where you do both inpatient low vision care and outpatient low vision care. It's a 34 bed facility. And when veterans go in for their inpatient low vision rehabilitation, they are an inpatient for anywhere from two to eight weeks. And they're really during those weeks immersed in kind of a classroom type setting where they get some in-depth rehabilitation training. The optometrist will work with all of the inpatients and do their initial testing and exam and kind of evaluation for ocular low vision devices and then work with all of the other multidisciplinary aspects of the rehabilitation team from visual skills and manual skills and orientation and mobility to social work and psychology and nurse practitioners to really give the veterans um, the opportunity to enhance their remaining vision and improve their quality of life and function. Um, in addition, we have uh, some components of medically necessary contact lenses, which takes place at our Jesse Brown VA location. Um, here we do medically necessary contact lenses. Uh, on a half day a week, we do follow ups and then a half day a week we do new fits. Um, and we see everything from uh, keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, post corneal surgeries, corneal traumas, aphakia, and we have a lot of varieties of diagnostic fitting sets. Um, so everything you need to be able to do some comprehensive and difficult medically necessary contact lens fittings. Uh, the residents are in direct care on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Um, and Wednesdays is devoted to more of a didactic and rounds and conference day. 
uh, all of the Jesse Brown attending uh, optometrists and the attending optometrists at the Heinz Blind Rehab Center come and have a set lecture schedule that they give to the residents. Um, we also participate in our own neuro-ophthalmology and glaucoma conferences here at Jesse Brown, where uh, once a month we meet with the neuro-ophthalmologist from Northwestern and have our residents and students and attendings sit down with her and discuss um, cases with her and bring the patients in and kind of do the exam together and get her input and thoughts. And we do the same thing with glaucoma conferences with some of our glaucoma specialists that rotate through here. Uh, in addition, our residents attend the weekly grand rounds through the UIC Department of Ophthalmology, which takes place on Wednesdays as well. And anytime UIC Ophthalmology has any symposiums, we make sure our residents and attendings attend all the symposiums that are offered. Um, so each resident works at both Heinz and Jesse Brown. So the year is divided into kind of three, like into thirds. So you're at the Heinz Blind Rehab Center for four months out of the year and Jesse Brown for eight months out of the year. When you're at the Heinz Blind Rehab Center, you're doing your direct patient care at the Rehabilitation Center on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And on Wednesdays, you're at Jesse Brown for our didactic and lecture day. And you're also at Jesse Brown on Fridays for all day direct care. When you're at Jesse Brown the remaining eight months, you are in direct care all day Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Um, we have a lot of faculty in our optometry department. I believe we have on about five full-time optometrists and two part-time optometrists that work at Jesse Brown, and then a full-time optometrist that works at the Heinz Blind Rehabilitation Center. Uh, and then we have two of our past directors who are now retired, Tom and Joan Stelmack, who stay on without compensation to continue to give our residents and students uh, lectures. Joan Stelmack also does uh, organize week, uh, monthly uh, journal club presentations as well. So here's uh, my contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out to me for any questions you have. Um, Dr. Kennard is the Chief of Optometry for here at Jesse Brown and the co-director for the ocular disease portion. And then Dr. Russo is the Chief of Optometry for the Blind Rehab Center and co-director for our low vision portion. I also invite you to view our website, which can give you a lot more details on our program as well. And I think two of our current residents, Dr. Jessica Islam and Dr. Jacob Condit, will be on to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Brown Bissonette, are you available to talk about Minneapolis VA Health Center? Uh, I'm Dr. Horder, one of the residents, and me and Dr. Falk are actually going to do the presentation. Uh, Wonderful. So Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. All right, so I'm uh, Megan Horder and um, Dr. Falk will also be talking. We're the current residents at the Minneapolis VA Optometry Residency Program for Primary Care and Vision Rehab. Uh, so the residency started in 2012. Um, there are over 180 VA optometry residency programs in the United States. Um, some benefits of a VA residency are direct experience serving a complex and rewarding population, uh, coordinating optometric eye care with other specialties, including ophthalmology to maximize patient care and learning experiences. Uh, and specific to our uh, VA residency program, we have um, low vision and polytrauma patients. Uh, here's some pictures from our clinic. Uh, the waiting room looks a little bit different these days with COVID um, and there's plexiglass and things now and the rooms and the waiting room, uh, but you get the idea of the layout there. Alrighty, so um, I'm Dr. Falk, as Dr. Horder mentioned, I'm the other resident here. 
Um, so kind of just highlighting certain areas of the program, um, we get to provide a lot of primary eye care and then um, we're divided also in brain injury and vision rehabilitation. So that's kind of divided in one week we're mostly primary care and then the next week um, we're half the week doing brain injury or vision rehabilitation. Um, and we get um, more confident and independent and really getting to know kind of our uh, population. And our preceptors are very um, encouraging and, and very um, wanting us to approach our patients with evidence-based medicine. And, and then, of course, we're getting didactic education on top of that. Um, we had our grand rounds presentation and then we get direct cl clinical care and then we also do self-studies and presentations. Um, so with our residency, we also interact with other specialties, including low vision therapists, living skilled therapists, and orientation and mobility therapists. We do a lot of referrals to all these places, and we will at some point get to shout out. It's been a little bit delayed with COVID, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to actually see um, them working with the patients. Uh, the polytrauma team at the Minneapolis VA consists of uh, physical med medicine and rehab physicians, neurology, speech language pathology, PT, OT, vision therapy, and of course optometry. Um, so it's really cool. Um, we get patients from a lot, like all over coming to the polytrauma unit, uh, just because there's only a few in the country. Uh, and so these patients tend to need a lot of help and it's really interesting and complex cases. So you definitely learn a lot, learn a lot with each patient. So kind of like we alluded to before, we um, some of the requirements is that there's a case presentation for the grand rounds to Illinois College of Optometry. Um, we were encouraged to present um, sp some posters and case reports um, for the optometry meeting for Academy. Um, both Dr. Horder and myself did that virtually this year through the AOA. And then we participate in weekly optometric grand rounds. And then we also present various times throughout the year on, and look at different reviews on ophthalmic literature and topics. And then as far as kind of the other stuff, we will attend kind of the, just a month. We attend monthly conferences with ophthalmology. Um, the nice part about us too with the VA is we have ophthalmology right next door. So if we ever have any questions, we can just go right next door. Um, to co-manage certain cases. And then we're required to write a case report um, or research paper of publishable quality. Publishable quality. Some benefits are um, health insurance, federal holidays, which just took advantage of that yesterday with Veterans Day, uh, vacation and sick leave, uh, five days of travel for conference attendance, uh, dedicated staff optometrists to help you succeed. Um, our staff optometrists are excellent and super helpful and just really great to work with. Um, interesting and challenging patients are in abundance at the VA as well. And that's it. And you can feel free to contact either I or Dr. Falk or um, Dr. Brown Bissonnet is our residency director. Thank you. Thank you to all the coordinators and residents who um, discuss their programs. I know we're getting short on time. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions now, which you can ask by unmuting yourself or in the chat. Um, and we can just extend the time if you guys have a lot of questions. Current residents, if you're on already, um, maybe you want to talk about certain things that drew you to programs or about how many programs that you applied for.
or current residents you want to tell us about um, the interview process? OK, we have a question. <laughs> what is the average number of programs that students usually apply to is the question. Um, I can tell you from data from OR Match, it's between four and five programs. Um, and then if you break it down between um, students that match during the matching process versus students that went unmatched, um, it's usually the people that matched were a little bit higher in terms of how many they ranked. Um, so if you don't match in the OR matching process, um, which happens to good programs and to good students sometimes just with the algorithm, it doesn't work out. There's a post match scramble. So students that didn't match and um, programs that didn't match can connect with each other um, and then the programs will fill. Um, a question about our um, inner. How does the accreditation work for new programs? Um, so for the new programs, um, they will get evaluated by the end of the year by the ACOE. Um, and then when they get their accreditation, it's backdated. So the first um, resident that does the program will then graduate from an accredited residency. Um, uh interviews are they going to be virtual in person my guess is that most interviews will be virtual and we'll try to keep um you know the interview process very similar to how it was um in person so if it was virtual with several doctors it will usually be with several doctors there'll probably be a q a session with the current residents and other people that are applying that year but um because of covid everything seems to be virtual this year how does ranking affect your match? So um, programs rank candidates as well as can uh, the candidates, the students rank programs and you have to just rank on um, where you want to be like, you know, try not. I would say try not to play the game of like, well, I think they like me the most. They're my second choice, but maybe I should rank them the most. Um, I would say rank them in the order that you want and remember the student ranking matters more than the programs ranking. So if you say this is my number one and they pick you as two, you're likely to get that program. Um, question for Dr. Martin. Is Dr. Martin on? Or Dr. Fromstein? Yeah. About how many specialty contact lenses you fit in a week? Yeah, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so typically, it depends where I'm at. So at the private practice, you can get a, a little bit more volume during the day so during the week i probably encounter i don't know 10 to 15 specialty lenses in a week but it really depends on the schedule and where you're at so direct care on wednesdays you know you have three clinic sessions so you're getting two to three pa patients per session so that's you know nine to 12 patients a day all of which have some sort of specialty contact lens so probably even more, probably 20 lens encounters a week. Um, wondering if you ultimately want to work in a hospital with an MD or in an ocular disease program, do you have to match into a program in a hospital? Is the type of residency ocular disease the most important? Um, I would say um, the type of program is probably important. Um, but if you have experience co-managing with MDs, I would assume that would make you um, more attractive. And most ocular disease programs 
Um, do you have you our interdisciplinarian work with MDs as well, but the extent or um, the types of MDs would obviously vary depending on the program. Um, I will say for if you want to work at a VA, um, most of the VA current VA doctors uh, graduated from a residency program. What's the etiquette for asking for letters of rec? Do we need to send them a CV? Um, I would say I would send them a CV and I would remind the doctor about um, how you worked with them if it's been a while. Like I was in clinic with you third year. I was your TA for this class. Um, doctors are pretty happy to write you a letter of rec. Like we, at least at school, we've all done residencies and we think residencies are super important and they give you so much benefit. So if you just say, I'm interested in residency, I would tell us the program that, or the types of programs that you were um, interested in so we can tailor that a little bit more. And on OR Match, um, you put in who you want to write your letters of rec, obviously after they've said yes to you over email or in person. Um, and I would say make sure that you personalize your letters. Um, so if you're applying to multiple programs, you have to put in separately for that specific doctor to do separate letters for each program. And that's better than a generic letter that one letter that they write to all the programs that you apply to. Um, and I would send the CV because then there might be other things in your CV they think is important to add that you might not have um, known would be important. So definitely. Um, and if coordinators on, if there's anything you want to add to that, please, you know, step up. Yeah, just to add to what Dr. McLeod said, um, in terms of etiquette, again, we're all very happy to write letters of rec. Um, so even if, you know, you've worked closely with me, but you're applying to a different program, I would still be happy to write one for you. Try to find, um, you know, people that can really speak to your clinical experience. Obviously, you're going into a residency program. And then I can't stress the importance of just asking early on. So, you know, a nice way to kind of go about it for some of you that are in your second or third year is if you have a really great experience working with an attending in clinic. At the end of the quarter, you know, you can say that you're interested in res residency and you might want to reach out to them later on um, just so you're kind of on their radar as well. And then as soon as you start thinking about applying to programs, reach out early on. Um, the longer you wait, you know, into winter quarter, uh, they're going to have more letters to write. It's going to become delayed. So just try to get get on that early. Current residents, anything you would want to add and things you learned along the way in the process that you could tell your younger self? So I'll add that um, if you ask for letters of recommendation from one of your professors, then um, I found that they are more willing to write personalized letters to every residency. However, a lot of kind of like the private practice doctors um, they may want to just send one letter. And so I gave my um, people an option because you can also just send them one and then they can just upload it and it would be just fine. Um, so I just let them know that like, hey, um, things have changed because in the past they would send letters directly, like they would mail in the letter, but now they can upload it on there. Would you like to do one letter for every residency or um, personalized letters? So well, that's something I did for the other doctors because I've had I, I wanted them to do personalized letters, but then I've had a couple be like, oh, yeah, I don't want to write like um, personalized letters. And so I didn't want to defer that from them not wanting to write me a letter. That's a good point. Um, I think another tip you can use is don't be afraid to ask that your letter writers you're asking if like you can say I'm hoping you can speak to this aspect about me if you want it to be more about like you being a good um, team player or a more like 
um, being easy to work with, or if it's more purely clinical or your potential to be a teacher, you can kind of target, you know, you don't get to see the letter and they still get to write what they want to write, but you can ask them to give you a certain slant to make your overall portfolio be more well-rounded. And a little tip for uh, just interviews and just interacting with people in general. Um, I wrote thank you notes to everyone I talked with for residency. So especially everyone you interview with. So whether that's a coordinator and people who write letters for you, that goes a long way. I couldn't agree more. And it's just so easy to send a quick email. Thank you right away. Um, we have um, from Dr. Bach, get letters in early. A couple of mine had technical difficulties and they took a while to get in. So make sure to follow up. Also, letting your letter of recommendation writers know why you want to do a residency and why you're interested in that specific program. I agree because it makes that letter more personal and not so generic. there's any Canadians listening right now, make sure you apply for your OPT as early as possible so you don't have any hiccups getting your documentation. Definitely. It's taken much longer than it has in the past, so the moment you match, please apply for that. <laughs> you, you can actually apply before that, just as an FYI. <laughs> Good to know. This explains why you got yours so soon. Yeah, I went like the day I was allowed to apply for it. You don't have to have a job offer um, when you apply for it. How many residencies did you guys apply for? Well, the overall average, you think? It probably depends on the program too, right? Yeah, I can answer that one. I uh, applied to three programs. Um, so you don't want to be applying to too many. Really look, do your research, know exactly what you want. Today was a good review of what each program has to offer. Um, so look into it, do your research, and you don't want to be applying to too, too many. Kind of narrow it down. Um, and I applied to three and, you know, when you go to the interviews, you get a really good feel as to whether or not you're a good fit for that program or not. So, um, yeah, I just knew during my interview process exactly where I wanted to end up. So don't overwhelm yourself, do your research and just narrow it down. I agree. I think the interview process makes a huge difference and you see like, oh, am I going to like working with these people for a year? Um, I agree. Don't apply to every residency under the sun, but I will say because interviews are going to be virtual um, and you don't have to take up as much time for traveling to interviews from your externship site. So you may want to think about maybe applying to places maybe you wouldn't have or a few more than usual. Yeah, yeah I have mentioned earlier. Go ahead. If, if you even if you go for an interview, you don't have to rank the um, the site too. So don't be afraid about that either. I applied to two, and then I um, I did rank both of them. But if you apply to more and and you do get interviews at more, you can still limit how many you want to rank. Um, yeah. Something else to add. I actually I applied to four. I almost applied to five. And kind of building off of what Dr. McLeod was just saying. Um, you don't want to have too, too many where you have to, like for me, you know, it was part of it was about travel because um, they were all over the country. And I realized that I just didn't have the time to interview at five places. And then I also kind of just had narrowed it to a point where I knew which one was my least favorite. And it felt a little silly to move forward with it. If I wasn't confident, it would be a good fit for me. Um, but for me, in uh, with pediatrics, I tried to, um, I, I did interview, um, at one uh, private practice to try to throw that in the mix. Um, and I, like I said, I kind of went all about in the in the country to to get a, a feel for like different locations and um, different like modalities at the different schools. Yeah, I, I think the average is four to five programs to apply. 
um, but people may not rank all of that. And I guess it also depends on the program, right? Um, Dr. Martin, like because you're a cornea contact lens, I have a feeling you applied to a few more programs because there's very few contact lens spots, for example. Yeah, so there's, I think, like 25, it should never might be changing now, of just straight up, if you're looking at like a school, um, and I was looking for more of a school position, so I applied, I think, five. Um, and I just interviewed at three of those just because of schedules and stuff. But, or no, I, I interviewed at a lot more than that. <laughs> um, I applied to five, and I think I interviewed at all of them, so. Um, but yeah, just a few more. Yeah, hey, we've had uh, tech lens residents apply to like 10 programs. That's not super unusual. Hey, Dr. McLeod, I know um, you just mentioned how, um, you know, it might be worthwhile to apply to or interview at a few more places since everything's online and it won't take as much time. Um, but it might be worth asking um, residency coordinators if it's still OK to visit the practice. Um, I know right now at Associated Eye Care, we're still letting um, people come visit the practice and I'm sure other places are too. And that can be another way to help um, get a feel of the place for when you do apply. That's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I know that interviews is just so important for in the ranking um, because I applied to three places, but I only ranked two. And the one that I thought I was going to rank first, you know, once I got there, I realized that um, we just didn't mesh like personality wise. And the in-person interview is just so important. So in this time where you kind of don't really get a chance to go in and look if you can't go there to visit, um, I would say really reach out to the residents and um, you can, you know, offer to maybe do like a Zoom call or something because talking to someone, you know, face to face, well, actually camera to camera, um, it's just so different than hearing their experience over email. And so just seeing like their personality and, and how they may rave or not rave about the program um, will give you a really good idea of what the program is like. Yeah, I feel like current residents are always very honest. They will tell you what their life is like, what their experience has been. And I think sometimes like the, you know, it, it is like maybe awkward with the camera, but I feel like your personality in some ways gets amplified a little bit. So I feel like you'll still get an idea of like, are we going to get along? Or are we not going to get along? <laughs> I also and then just really important to like come with like as many questions as you can think of because you're like interviewing them too and you want to make sure it's a good fit for yourself as well um and so like i tried to like research and figure out places where like there's some information but i wanted to know more and just like do your kind of background information and like try and figure out what you need to know to know that it's a good fit for you definitely and showing that you've done that research and you want to know more comes off really great in the interview process and, you know, even though there's kind of like that magic range, you know, like that around three to four that most people apply to, um, there's nothing that says you can't contact multiple other residencies. You can exceed 10 even if you want um, to contact the coordinators, the residents, you know, to get a good idea of the program before you really commit to it. Yeah, for sure. In your queue for or match, you can add as many programs as you like. It's only if you want to do more than 10 completed applications that they're going to charge you extra per program. And once those coordinators have your email because you show up in their queue, they might reach out and, and maybe that'll make a difference to you. If you guys have specific questions to a specific resident, I mean, definitely email them, but you can also ask it here as well. It doesn't have to be only general questions. I have a question that I don't really want to type out. Um, so uh, for the people who are at ICO, like on the campus there for like different top, like uh, specialties that you guys have, are there, um, like specifics for like if you're disease or contacts, is there a different amount of flexibility 
in each program as to if they would let you do like a day in peds or a day in contact lens if you're a low vision person or if you're a peds person and you want to do a day in low vision is there like can you guys talk about the flexibility like can you only do that maybe once a month or do some of you are you're not allowed to do that um let me know I can probably answer that question. So I'm a primary care and ocular disease resident, and I'm currently scheduled in specialty contact lenses. So I have a specific like four hour shift um, once a week for the next quarter. So I'll be there for the next few months. And then you can always request different um, clinic se sessions like PEDS, low vision, basic contact lenses, whatever you want really and you will get scheduled if there's availability for it. Um, so I think one of the other residents is doing PEDS, like one of the other disease residents is doing a PEDS and she had it last quarter and again this quarter. So there is a lot of flexibility in that regard. So um, I'm one of the pediatrics residents. Um, in terms of the, the PEDS residencies and flexibility, um, I have gotten some flexibility. Um, I've been able to get into the developmental disability clinic, which is kind of paralleled into pediatrics. Um, I'm also in primary care this quarter. Um, one of the things with pediatrics versus ocular disease is that the ocular disease um, residents do get priority over certain clinics. Um, so for example, um, pretty much everybody wants to get into neuro. Um, but that goes to a higher priority to the ocular disease because that's actually part of their program. Um, so it's it's one of those things where if um, like Dr. Winner or I want to get into neuro, we have to try to see if we can fit it in the schedule. But it's it's kind of a first come to the uh, ocular disease because that's that's part of their their curriculum. To answer your question about whether you would go in for one day, um, typically if you want to rotate through a special, a different specialty, then it would be for the full quarter. So um, you can switch out one of your shifts for the um, the other specialty. Or I actually added on a shift. Um, it's tiring, so I wouldn't recommend it. But um, that's an option as well. So I really would say that at ICO, you know, your residency is what you make of it and um they're really flexible and always willing to work with you so like for neuro i think another reason why it's like difficult for um kelly and i i mean dr cohen and i to get in, in on it too is because of covid is a factor um and so they are limiting the number of residents that are in and hopefully you know with covid that will end and um, there will be more opportunity in the future On low vision, you guys want to speak to your flexibility? Sure. So um, uh, my residency director has been really great trying to um, rearrange my schedule so that I can get in um, any of the electives that I've wanted. So um, right now I'm filling in for PEDS. So I do that once a week for four hours and it's been great. Um, we have a uh, I'd say we have a pretty good amount of flexibility. I'm able to kind of get into, I was able to do the neuro clinic um, early on. Um, and so I know that one can be tough to get into. Um, but so far I've been able to rotate through anything that I, I've wanted to. I would say probably overall, if you request it early, you have a better chance, which I know that's hard. But um, when you first start your first quarter, if you're saying like, I just want to get into neuro, um, right away maybe you'll have a better chance of getting into neuro by the end of the year for sure okay there's a question in chat about climate with doctors with dyed hair piercings what is our climate guys dr trevino said he has no problem i can to dyed hair so our uh, pediatric resident last year actually had purple hair for a while and then she also had green hair for a while and also blue hair for a while um Maybe it was helpful because she was in peds and all the kids loved it, but you no, know, she didn't have any problems at all because she does rotate through other clinics and she was also in urgent care. 
and um, I had like silver hair at the beginning of this residency, although it's since faded. But um, no one has said anything about it, so I assume it was fine. I missed your silver hair. <laughs> I, I miss it too. Um, I have I have some tattoos on my arms um, that I normally. Uh, like in clinical settings, I try to wear sleeves that will cover it. Um, but with COVID and wearing um, scrubs, I decided to let them show. And I've never had anybody make a comment. Um, our patients are really easygoing. So I've never felt, you know, judged by them. Um, and all our fac faculty are really accepting. I've seen, I've actually seen a, a handful of students that have tattoos that are showing um, and piercings as well. So it's a pretty, pretty open environment. All right, I'll give it a few more minutes. I'm sure everyone <laughs> is tired from the long meeting here. All right, it looks like that might be the end. Oh, wait. Um, a recording of the session will be available later. Um, yes, um, I'm going to have ICO Communications try to put it on the um, ICO website in the residency section. Um, that might take a, a week or two, but I can definitely um, have it on the, for ICO students, the ICO SharePoint will probably be a little bit faster. Any like closing things that you guys want to add? Apply early. Yeah, and I think somebody else mentioned it, but take advantage of the fact that your interviews are going to be virtual. Um, there's pros and cons to that, but like I was saying before, you know, it's it's a lot of logistics to figure out when you're interviewing at multiple different locations and like you know if you were on the fence about one location that you weren't 100 percent sure if you wanted to go all the way out there just give it a try because there's you know there's nothing to lose you know everything's just right on your computer i, I just had a comment that i definitely do not regret doing residency and i'm super happy and it's not even halfway over so if you're at all interested i think it's definitely worth pursuing I don't think anyone has ever regretted it. <laughs> and, and I guess one other thing I would say, um, as a former ICO student who's now doing an ICO residency, I remember as a student being concerned, like, would it kind of be too repetitive or am I not stepping out of the box enough, you know, doing a residency at the same place where I had my education? Um, or would I, you know, is it strange working with attendings who you were their student and now you're a colleague? Um, and I was told that it, it feels a completely different experience um, by Dr. Haas, who did the same thing before us. And I can affirm it does feel completely different. It kind of feels like being in the same place, but but your roles, your role has completely changed and your former teachers treat you like a peer. Um, they can still be mentors to you when you need them to be. But um, I feel like completely like trusted um, by my colleagues and it and everyone respects your new role. And I've learned a lot so far. That's a good note to end. On. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. It really means a lot. Have a good night.